Hi, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. This week, we're doing something special here on the show. So on episode 68 of Beyond Six Seconds, I interviewed Heidi Bennett. She's the host of the Vibrant Visionaries podcast, and we were talking about the coaching work that she does with multi-creative professionals. Since we both talk with creative and entrepreneurial people on our podcasts about their careers and their stories, we realized that our listeners would most likely enjoy listening to both of our podcasts. So this week, Heidi and I decided to do an episode swap. Heidi's going to publish my interview with her on the Vibrant Visionaries podcast, and I've picked out one of her podcast's interview episodes to feature here today on Beyond Six Seconds. So today I present to you Heidi's interview with Emily Winston. Emily lives in the San Francisco Bay Area, and she missed the authentic New York bagels from her youth so much that she decided to make them herself and dive headfirst into opening a retail bagel bakery called Boychick Bagels in Berkeley, California. It's a great story of how Emily identified a need in the market and created her own opportunity to fill that need. She didn't start out as a bagel baking pro, but through lots of hard work, training, and practice, she is one now. If you've ever had a craving for an authentic New York bagel or ever taste a dream that just seemed out of reach, you'll really enjoy this episode from Vibrant Visionaries. And if you want to hear more episodes of Vibrant Visionaries, you can find them on Heidi's website, which is vibrantvisionaries.com. And now, on with the episode. Welcome to another episode of Vibrant Visionaries with Heidi Bennett, happily broadcasting from KACRLP Alameda Community Radio. Enjoy the show. All right, everybody, I'm so excited to bring on a longtime friend, but somebody I actually haven't caught up with in a while, and that is Emily Winston. Welcome, Emily. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, I met you a few years back, and you were doing a few different creative projects, and now you've got a brand new, almost singular focus, I'd say. So can you tell me a little Definitely. bit about where it's, you're at these days and what it's your a, project it's is? It's a singular focus that's taking over my life in a big, big way. So it's a bagel shop. But not just any bagel shop. I could back up a little bit. And so I'm from New Jersey, Jewish. I ate a lot of bagels growing up. But the H&H bagel on the Upper West Side of Manhattan was like the golden bagel. It was a special occasion bagel. And fast forward many years, I've been living out here, stopped eating the bagels because they just weren't very good. I don't want to bother eating a bagel if it's not going to be a good bagel. And in 2012, I learned that H&H was shut down for tax fraud. Mm. And now the sacred bagel is no more. And I was deeply upset about this. And I decided to, well, maybe I can just figure out how to make it for myself. And that just turned into this long-term hobby that I would play with every now and then and tweak the recipe a little bit, try something else. Had a lot of not very good bagels for a while, but they slowly <laughs> got all better and better. And I'd put it down for months at a time and then pick it back up, feed them to all my neighbors at the neighborhood potluck. And after five years, they got really good. I had people telling me you should really be looking into selling these. And I thought, well, maybe. I had some frustrations with the job I'd been doing. And I was, you know, maybe I'll just look into this. Mm -hmm. That that could be, this could be interesting, or at least it'll be a fun new hobby. I'll start exploring business classes. I've always played with the idea of going and getting an MBA mm -hmm. every few years since I've left college. So I'll look into this whole business thing. So I hooked up with Food Craft Institute and started taking classes with them. And they invited me to be in the Real Festival in September of the previous year. And so I launched, I got a cottage food license so I could legally do that. Had a lot of very happy New Yorkers that day mm. who were very excited. And then the East Bay Express picked me up right away. She's like, oh, a new bagel. And her article released a week later saying this is the best bagel in the state. Wow. And everyone kind of lost their minds. <laughs> and I did some pop-ups and I had people lined up out the door and down to the corner. And for me, the this was just a proof of concept business. I never really wanted to do a, gosh, I'm going to, my business plan is to make bagels in my house and sell them. It's a deeply inefficient thing to make bagels in your house. Sure. Um, there's a reason why bagel bakeries are like a standalone thing. There's all kinds of very specific equipment that you really want to have. The big question I got asked was, okay, yeah, your friends are very happy about eating your bagels for free, but does that mean that you have strangers willing to pay you money for them? So with the, this limited pop-ups, I got my answer was a very, very resounding yes. 
people were, and then they were, wanted more. They're like, well, how, how, how can I get more bagels? And right. how can I get more bagels? And I said, well, hold on. I don't really want to be producing. <laughs> it takes, it took me seven hours of labor to make nine dozen bagels wow. in my house. So this is not an efficient process. This is not how I want to be spending my time. <laughs> and my house is covered in seeds. And like, <laughs> that doesn't include cleaning up afterwards and cleaning up all these seeds that are everywhere. I said, well, that's, that's a proof of concept. People really are crazy about my bagels. That answers that question. When you say taking classes, were you so were you taking an MBA? So Where did I that took come in? so the Food Craft Institute. They were these ad hoc. There were like a few classes that were a few hours at a time, and then there were a few classes that were like two full days. Okay. I took a week long class at the San Francisco Baking Institute, which was awesome. Uh, I totally recommend that for anyone who wants to be serious in their baking in any capacity. Then they have they have weekend classes. They have these week long classes. This was like an introduction to professional bread baking. Okay. And then they have like super hardcore. If you're like, I'm going to dedicate my life to being a pastry chef. They have something like an eight or nine month program where you can, you're intensively learning to do all of all of the baking. So a huge range of of stuff. It's an awesome resource. And then I started taking classes uh, with the Alameda County Small Business Association. Cool. Yeah, I just wanted to interject in there to kind of fill in the the blanks with the okay. who's asking you these questions and how you're. Um calculating this data and then and and the support there's, that you're getting as you yeah these move classes along this here. is great there's really there's an amazing amazing resources out here for for business and specifically for food so food craft institute was specifically for food entrepreneurship sbdc course it was a 10-week series and it was geared specifically towards food entrepreneurship um and we had a lot of all these guests from different aspects of business and you know let's look at accounting and let's look at you know hospitality and let's look at branding and marketing and all of these different things so it's been it's been tremendous i've loved it so i've loved i love school i'm a giant nerd mm -hmm. so all of the classes for me i'm like oh the classes just make me happy i'm learning things and this is really fascinating worked on the business plan and started producing projections and the numbers look really good i'm like i needed to sell myself on the numbers like if i'm going to do this I want to feel that this is a solid business. And then it came time to be like, well, now I need a location. <laughs> and that's when things started to get really scary. It's all fun and games to like go to classes and make business proposals and projections and, and look at the numbers that look really nice. And it's another thing to sign a five-year lease for an amazing amount of money. That's when things really took a turn for the, the <laughs> deeply serious and it was no longer fun and games. But the space I got, so... Which is crazy. So I wound up uh, being introduced to Noah Alper, who is the Noah behind Noah's Bagels. And I met him over a year ago. Gave him some bagels, and he really liked my bagels, and we hit it off pretty well. I should back up. So he started at Noah's in 1989. Okay. It did really well. His brother joined. Another guy joined. They blew it out to 38 stores in six years. And then the Einstein group out of Denver was going around the country buying up bagel shops, and they made him an offer for $100 million. Wow. And they took it. So he's not been associated with that for, for 25 years now. He's just been retired. So he's like, well, corporate closed my original store in Rockridge. So it's the very north end of Rockridge that's technically in Berkeley. It's college at Alcatraz. He's like, it was a great store. It would be perfect for you. You should take it. So I went to look at it. I'm like, I don't know. It seems a little small. I originally was thinking more of a production facility mm. and doing just direct delivery because I don't have any restaurant background. And so I really hemmed and hawed about it. And I was went off looking at all this real estate all over the place and was just kind of feeling discouraged. And then I came back to it and then I met the owner and gave him some bagels and he loved my bagels. And he said, you need to take this space. Mm. I want you in this space. Wow. And he's a wonderful guy. We really hit it off. And I said, well, if I change the business plan a little bit and say, well, if I make it more of a retail focus, this actually works really well. And the space, the, the location is so dynamite. Rejigger the business plan a bit to say, well, what if it's primarily, you know, a walk-in and people are going to need to get bagel sandwiches and the whole thing. It needs to be right. a bit more of a restaurant experience, not just, not just bagels in bags. And I'm like, well, why not? <laughs> I'm, like, <laughs> I'm already way in over my head. We could just kind of keep going with it double down on things I don't know how to do. And um, so I took it. I signed that lease. Construction's taken a lot longer than it could have. And permitting's been challenging. Drama on the equipment front. Mm. Equipment not coming when it's supposed to come. And all kinds of drama. No, fortunately, nothing's been like completely horrendous. But it's like everything's just taking a bit longer. Everyone I spoke to in the restaurant industry 
as I've over the last year told me that's exactly what to expect that they're like it'll take twice the time and twice the money so so far it's only been twice the time uh, there's still plenty of time for that to get worse and for <laughs> the budget to double but hopefully it won't so that's where I'm at and, and right now we are in the middle of construction my oven is supposed to arrive in two weeks and then things start really rocking and rolling and I'm hoping to open in April wow. sometime and yeah, that sounds right for every independent business that I've ever worked for. And I used to work at Julie's Coffee and Tea Garden. They actually hired me as the manager before opening. And I remember everything took longer. And Julie was coming from a, a wholesale background, not a retail background. So there was plenty to learn. And actually, my very first job was working at a bagel shop oh. <laughs> in Sacramento. I can't speak to the authenticity. I've actually never been to New York, but the owner um, was a Jewish gentleman and he was similarly motivated to run his own place to, to be able to produce what he wanted to eat. It had been open for a couple of years by the time I worked there, but I learned everything, you know, from opening to closing to cleaning to putting the bagels in the water bath and doing the baking. And we used a bagel matic there. Yeah. And uh, so it was, it was a unique opportunity to learn, even though I wasn't one of the official bakers, you know, a small business like that, you learn everything. And I've worked at a, a muffin bakery run by two women in, in uh, Sacramento as well. And yeah, there was a certain point where their night baker had to go to rehab. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we were out of a night baker. And, and I'd been working there for a while. And I said, teach me and I'll come in at one o'clock in the morning and learn how to make the, bake those mm -hmm. artisanal well, muffins. Well, good to know I can call you if I have any questions about my bagel matic. <laughs> I'm excited, looking forward to getting that in and starting to play with it. That's, yeah. that's going to be a whole production right there, but I'm good with equipment. So cool. So yeah, I'd like to talk a little bit about that at the top of this conversation. I mentioned that I felt you were the quintessential multi creative. So I'd love to hear just about some of the other things you've done in life that you've dabbled with. Um, and maybe if you can see where those kind of connect to where you are now. Sure. Well, my background, my undergrad degree is in mechanical engineering. And I've always just been really big on figuring out how, how does stuff work? How do I make things? I've always had an interest in that and particularly design, product design. And that's really big. And for a while, I actually had this hobby business doing lighting. I was doing custom lighting. I took the bottles. I had worked at St. George Spirits for a while and I was taking their bottles and cutting them at the crucible and making these lighting fixtures. And I put them in several houses and restaurants in the area. Um, which, of course, I will be making some pendant lights for the shop. Cool. So that's already, actually, I have that all ready to go. But that was very much, I'm figuring this thing out. It's working. It looks beautiful. It was very much like, I'm making this thing, and it's the way I want it to be. There's a lot of food in my background, too. Uh, my father is a food chemist. Mm. And so I grew up with this very... What was totally normal to me, but not turns out not normal to everyone else's life, where my father would bring home things and he'd have us do taste testing, like serious. And that was, uh, you know, here's these three different crackers, like eat them, like which one tastes stale or how stale does this taste? Or let's like analyze the flavors carefully of, mm. of some whole panel of things. Actually very much like wine tasting, which I got into later in college. But that was such a standard piece of my childhood. And then he'd also bring me to food production plants. He'd do inspections, he'd do all kinds of things. And he'd bring me along because he thought it was it was fun. So I grew up like that's a very normal experience for me. I'm like, oh, okay. And I've been doing that lately for things I've been visiting coffee roasting facilities and stuff. And like, mm. oh, like, this just reminds me of like my childhood, practically, I'm going <laughs> like, oh, goody, I'm going on a tour of a new another food place. And he had me do things like when I was home from college one summer, he brought me into Strites on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, their original matzah plant. Mm. There was a problem with their oven. It wasn't uh, baking evenly. So he brought me and this professor of mechanical engineering from Rutgers. I'm not sure how he roped him into this. I was definitely roped in. I wanted to be like <laughs> loafing around and he made me come in and we kind of hung out there all day and twiddled with the oven and and got it working a lot better. And it was crazy. It was a huge ancient tunnel oven of like poured cement. It was like, like 
you couldn't just get in and service it easily. And then there were these old metal rods that went in and like opened and closed dampers. And some of them, it turns out we were pretty sure they were broken, but you couldn't know because they were like deep inside this thing and you mm. could not open it up to see what was going on. Uh, they've since very sadly closed that plant and moved the whole operations to a very new facility in New Jersey, which is a little sad because it's like, oh, it was my, mm. it was my matzo oven now. Um, so all kinds of wacky stuff. And I've been big on like fixing things and I have this affectionately called the coffee robot in my house that was part of my graduate program. And I was the only one who could manage to take care of it, this crazy thing. And I, I feel like I'm looking forward to getting my bagel matic because I just have a hunch it'll be the same kind of thing. And so there's going to be this very elaborate piece of machinery that will want some hands-on love and care. Yeah. And, and that's something I'm very good at. I've always been big on all kinds of design. I've done like pretty amateur, but digital design for all of my various hobbies. I had made some coffee liqueur a while back and made some very overly elaborate labels, just some like dabbling in graphic design in general, just making stuff. I've just always been big on like, oh, what is this thing? What is this new interest I have? I'll dive in and I want it to be awesome and I want it to look pretty. All of these things I feel are very much like initially when I decided to do this or went through a lot of like soul searching, like, do I really want to do this? This has just been like, what? I'm going to make bagels. <laughs> this is not what I, you know, really thought I was going to be doing with my life. Very surprising to me more than anyone else. And like, I have no, I have no business running a bagel shop. I don't have any business in food production or restaurant management or any of these things. But it turns out that a lot of stuff I've done, all of these things I just mentioned, totally play into this. I'm actually thinking about this shop as more of an experience even than a bakery. I want you to walk in. This is going to be the most New York thing outside of New York as genuine as you could have a genuine experience that's not actually in the place, the most genuine New York experience you could have. I'm like very consciously going about designing that. Um, so it's really exciting and fun for me to think about that. And the graphics I'm designing, the bags and the paper and there's t-shirts and there's, I just already designed a travel coffee mug and got that ordered. And so there's all these fun artsy things and the, like my signature lights that are going up in the front of the house and just all sorts of things. It's like design, design, design. Here's my memories of H&H &H and Zabar's, which was next door, and Russ and Daughters, and uh, more recently, Essa Bagels. And what do I want this to be? And how am I positioning it? And putting a lot of my favorite things, kind of New York bagel experiences together with a little bit of creative license and creating my fantasy New York bagel shop with you know, what I consider to be the best bagels in existence, which are no longer available anywhere with the best fish I can get my hands on. I'll be importing fish from New York, almost like a mini Russ and Daughters experience and, and bring them together and just make the whole thing really neat. So not just the bagel like started it, but I'm building, there's all this stuff that's happening around it that I've been yeah. focusing on lately. That's so cool. Yeah. And I can see how all of these other creative interests of yours can play into that. And, and when you run a business like this, it's a great advantage to have a lot of different talents and skills and ideas about it and instead of just, you know, and some people who do go get an MBA, it's boop, 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 I'm going to open a business. And maybe it's because they're driven by just this vision that they've made within their um, business plan. But to have it be this passion project behind this lost bagel and then the, the memories around it and all that, it's, it sounds really exciting. And I think about hospitality with you too. Like um, I remember coming out to St. George Spirits when you were working there and doing the tasting and you're quite unnatural and, and people can hear, you Thank know, you. in this conversation in listening to you that you're a, a natural, social, you know, friendly, conversational person. So I'm sure that will really serve you well, too. I think so. I've gotten a lot of feedback on that already. I had my very good friend tell me when, who helped with the initial um, event at Eat Real said, no, 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 your job is to be in front of the booth, not serving the food. Now I've developed the food and I made all the bagels, but it said, we got this. We'll do all the ringing up. You go out and talk to the people. And so that's in a big way, that's 
going to be my new job. And part of the part of the big challenge for me right now is I need to get, you know, get the bagel dialed in on the new equipment, but I'm going to have to kind of let it go and let other people do a lot of the baking or at least some of the baking it pretty quickly. I can't bake the bagels, take your order, make your sandwich, hand it to you. Like that's not a practical situation. So right. there's going to have to be this whole staff executing all of this. And then I can be in the front talking to people about bagels. <laughs> it's almost like that's going to be my job and not, I'm kind of getting fired from the making of the bagels pretty, pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm going to, you know, I'm now this new bagel evangelist of all bizarre <laughs> jobs to have, <laughs> but it's fun. I'm kind of, I'm, you know, maybe I'll get tired of it at some point, but right now it's super fun and people dig it. People are crazy about bagels. I'm... I don't know what it is. There's like an emotional, mm -hmm. there's memories involved. There's all this nostalgia, the bagels that people gr grew up with, or they hold very dear to their hearts and they want that flavor and it there's like almost like it has to be close enough to the bagel they grew up loving that it can like unlock that right it, it makes me think of um ratatouille did you see ratatouille? i did it a long time ago so in ratatouille the critic comes and has this experience eating it does sound familiar the perfect meal and it visually flashes him back to being a child and connecting to his experience of basically being loved sure and, and well fed. that's actually it's yeah what is it it's uh what Proust madeline that um i'd have to check on that i want to say that that was who that was this madeline and he said that he had all these memories and yeah this oh, okay so associated with the madeline cookie oh right, um, right. okay yes and yeah so that people have these food memories that just unlock so much and they can be a lot of times it's you know your mother's or your grandmother's specific dish but or it could be this kind of commercially produced bagel. I've gotten so much fascinating feedback from people who are just like, oh my God, thank you, thank you, thank you for what you're doing. This is a mitzvah. Like you're doing this public service. You are bringing the holy bagel to this barren wasteland. <laughs> and, you know, we have, and, and like, what's interesting is it's like, and, you know, I've kind of felt that way too, which is what motivated my whole project for me. But it's not that we don't have any bagels here, and there's some of them are pretty good, but none of them, a lot of people are just like, well, here's my creative, here's my east-west sourdough hybrid right. bagel, or here's my creative take on a bagel. But what so many people, including myself, wanted was the bagel I grew up with. I don't want your creative bagel. I don't want, and I'm not making, I don't want to make an Emily bagel. I want the H&H &H bagel. Right. <laughs> so that's what I wanted. It, and it turns out that a lot of other people, it's it's resonating with them in a very, very big way. But it's it's really deeply fascinating to me. I just get the most amazing feedback all the time about how delighted people are that I'm doing this. And they're like, you know, good luck. Get open. I have people in the neighborhood. If I'm in there and the doors open, people pop in and they're like, hurry up and open already. We want our bagels. And, and then they're like, it's okay. Like, they're like, well, wait, we'll wait, we'll wait. I got this amazing voicemail from an older guy yesterday saying that he was in the neighborhood and he wanted to know when I'd be opening so that the hordes could descend. And like, this is the sweetest way. He's like, the descending hordes. And I was like, oh, it just made my day. I'm like, this is so great. And they're all supportive and they're so excited. Like, what other foods do people get like this excited about? It's yeah. just blowing me away. That's awesome. Well, before we wrap up, I'd like to make sure people know the name of your business. We oh. haven't even talked Oops. about that. And <laughs> I'd love if you wouldn't mind sharing the story behind the name, because I think it's just such a great name. <laughs> and also your website address, all your all that kind of good stuff before we wrap of up. Of course. So it's Boychik Bagels, and it's spelled B-O-I-C-H-I-K. And it's a Yiddish word. It's normally spelled B-O-Y-C-H-I-K. And it's pronounced Boychik, and in Yiddish, it means cute little boy. So it's it's the nickname that every Jewish grandmother calls her grandson, basically up from, you know, ages probably 2 to 12 or so. And it's the cheek-pinching, <laughs> like, oh, my cute little boy chick, this diminutive, loved term. I grew up uh, in a family of, we have, it was three sisters, so I didn't actually hear that word very much growing up. But... When I was several years ago, I want to say it must have been, I don't know, maybe seven years ago now, 
and I had what I what I call had gone butch where mm-hmm. I had kind of went to very masculine clothing and hair and I went home to visit for the first time since kind of doing that and went to visit my grandmother and was a little nervous about what she would say because she's a very opinionated Jewish grandmother and she took a look at me and said, oh, such a cute boy chick. Will you, will you be having your bar mitzvah soon? Because... <laughs> and we had a good laugh. And it was really cute. And it was really sweet. And I just love that. It was really. And then she passed away a few years after that. And it is true. I'm, I'm very small. I'm only five feet tall. I'm actually basically the size of a 12, 13-year-old boy. So and I got mistaken for such. So it totally works perfectly. And when I thought about what name do I want to give this project, uh, actually, ori- the original working name for my hobby venture was E&E Bagels because my now ex-wife, her name also started with an E and then it was an homage to H&H. Of course, then she left and I'm like, well, now I need a new name for this. And I will be, you know, bagels. There's a lot of B names for bagel right. shops because it works well. So we've got beauties and there's a ton of like bagel boys on the East Coast. And I thought about that. I'm like, well, what about boy chick? Yeah. So I got it from that moment with my grandmother. And it's cool because and I have a lot of people really excited. Well, there's a lot of people who are like, they don't know what it is. And they're confused. And then they call it bio chick because they're reading it quickly and and getting it confused. But there's a lot of people, especially Jews love it. In the queer community, people really dig it. And so it's a little bit of an insider play on words. And I have so many middle-aged men that have come up to me at pop-ups and are like, oh, my grandmother called me boy chick. I haven't heard that in 20 years. And they get all excited and they're like, when are you going to have a t-shirt I can buy? So (laughs) they all want swag. And it's sweet because it just brings you back. So it's there's more nostalgia. So it's first, it's I'm giving you like, the it's the bagel that you're nostalgic about that you haven't had in 20 years. And this word that you haven't heard in 20 years. And it's kind of all going back together to this nice, warm, fuzzy place in your past. Well, thank you so much for spending time with me today, Emily. And so before we wrap up, I also want to make sure that people know what your website is and how people can connect with you and get on your newsletter and make sure they know when your shop opens. Well, I've got Facebook and Instagram, of course, and that's all under Boy Chick Bagels. And my website is boychickbagels.com and there's the email sign up right on the main page there and they could they'll get the emails for exactly all the news as soon as I'm ready to release it and that's pretty much it and I don't think I mentioned it but I met you here in Alameda are you still living in Alameda I am cool all right thanks again Emily it was great having you wonderful thank you that wraps up another episode of Vibrant Visionaries with Heidi Bennett I'm a business and wellness coach for multi-creatives. If you're curious about what it's like working with me, you can find me at HeidiBennett.com. And if you'd like to hear all the other episodes of Vibrant Visionaries, you can check out VibrantVisionaries.com. Thanks for listening to KACR LP Alameda Community Radio. Ciao!